Good morning. I'll start again. Let me welcome you to a, a webinar being organized by this, or sponsored by the School for the Study of Canada, Trent University, a people's economy, new normal, freeing us from the free market. I'm excited to welcome you to this seminar on behalf of the School for the Study of Canada. It's been organized by Mike Perry, one of our school's graduate students, and we have a number of guests who are speaking to this event and I would like to specifically welcome and thank them for attending. I'm excited the School for Study of Canada can support and sponsor this event. I think it's an extremely important topic and speaks to the relationship between not just COVID-19 and what what is happening immediately in the world around us but broader trends in relationship between society, economy, politics and general health and well-being of, of populations, both in Canada and around the world. And the Canadian angle is certainly, and the local and the angle is certainly what interests the School of Study of Canada, and looking towards a more uh, bottom-up grassroots approach to understanding and responding to the challenges that uh, face us in the world today. So again, I'd like to thank Mike for organizing this. I'd like to welcome all of you for coming to this webinar, and hopefully you'll have questions for us and questions for each speaker, and uh, we'll come away with a new, new understanding and a new sense, I think, of engagement and purpose and some new hope in terms of what we can do to create a new normal in post-COVID uh, environment. So with that, I would like to turn the webinar over to your moderator, Michael Perry, School for Study of Canada and a, a, a PhD student in the Frost Centre within the School for Study of Canada. So Mike? Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Heather, and welcome everyone. Uh, uh, at Trent especially, we certainly celebrate diversity and inclusion, so the uh, hashtag on the event invitation is correct. Everyone was welcome and everyone is welcome here this morning. I just want to briefly acknowledge the lands from which I'm broadcasting on here in Kawartha Lakes, the uh, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. And uh, as a proud new member of the Métis Nation, uh, I can tell you that uh, canoes certainly use the waterways here um, for centuries. And also the word Kawartha Lakes, which is, is, this land is now known to many, uh, is uh, Anishinaabe for shining waters and smiling, happy people. <laughs> so hopefully we're able to, to live up to the namesake. And uh, I wish you all the best from uh, Kawartha Lakes here this morning. Uh, I'd just like to be able to run down a few things that during our time together. We did kind of put this webinar together just as COVID was starting. So we didn't have all the feedback about Zoom events, Zoom fatigue, online uh, taking a long time and being tiring. So we may not use the two full uh, two and a half hours. We'll see how things go. But uh, please uh, join in discussion. As advertised, we wanna make sure we have a very open and free ranging discussion. Uh, for those of you who Zoom, you've used Zoom before, um, you'll know how to use the chat. But to the right hand side of your screen, there should be a chat function and you'll be able to uh, chime in and, and add comments or, or questions as our panelists, our speakers are presenting today. And I'd invite our panelists to please keep half an eye on the, on the chat so it can be responsive and I'll also bring forward uh, some questions or comments as we go. Also, uh, there is a question and answer function you'll see at the bottom of your screen and uh, you'll be able to send questions. Please put your name on those questions so I can cite you and uh, we'll, uh, we'll address those during the question and answer session. Also, just a tip about Zoom meetings is to be sure to please mute yourself. The mute button is down in the left-hand bottom corner of your screen, a little microphone with a little green flash there. When you mute yourself, that just uh, takes out any background noise that may interfere with the sound and the connection. And also then if you have a comment and I'm able to select you or call upon you, you'll be able to unmute yourself and make that, uh, make that comment. So I'd just like to, with that said, thank again uh, the Trent University School for the Study of Canada, thanking Heather, uh, Trent IT Services, of course, uh, Janine Crow, who helped put this event together, and Kathy Scholl, who's taking notes for us, also from the Frost Centre. What we'll be doing today uh, is running through uh, very uh, important remarks on this opportunity and I'll, I'll wrap up in a minute, kind of set the stage as to why we're having this event and why I feel anyway it's important and 
the speakers felt it was important enough to attend. Uh, we'll hear from Pierre uh, and Rick, Nora, Dennis, Peggy, and David. And then, um, as we've learned, as with all good webinars or Zoom meetings, we'll have a health break for about five minutes or so. Come back promptly. We'll have a discussion. Then we'll hear from our special guest, Linda McQuag. Uh, have some more discussion after Linda's remarks, and then maybe talk about some next steps or how this project might move forward. So, very briefly, what's brought us here today? I mean, we could be anywhere in the world this morning. Uh, okay, well, maybe not necessarily <laughs> due to COVID, but here we all are on a Tuesday, sorry, a Wednesday morning, sitting down having a webinar, albeit many of us in the comfort of our own home. So, what has brought us here today? to talk about you know, uh, a people's economy, a new normal. Well, again, just by way of background, uh, I was doing some, some work on public leadership at Harvard, and part of it was to put together a project. And so the project that got put together, uh, selfishly, we have a small leadership team together, was around organizing people here locally to show what a more just, inclusive, and green local economy can be. We want to inspire municipal government and community organizations to implement a list of specific non-free market economic measures. We're going to do this and we're going to launch our campaign today actually uh, with this our first tactic because what, what I've found in listening is that on the encouraging side I've heard more and more people, a lot of people I wouldn't necessarily expect, say, yes, you know, the old economy was broken. Yes, we don't want to go back to living paycheck to paycheck. We don't want a million kids going hungry in Canada every night while, you know, the, the CEO of Scotiabank, for example, makes, uh, you know, $11, billion, $11 million in compensation. Uh, so wealth inequality, the growing gap, those issues have been playing out more and more uh, since, since COVID. And I think, too, a spirit of community, more of a spirit of togetherness. And a lot of people I've found talking about how they're able to have an economy that rather than is based on runaway growth for growth's sake and profiteering, is there something we can have that better reflects our values uh, of togetherness, of community, of helping one another, and doing so, which is key, within the means of the planet. And so we have these great discussions, but I found, uh, to be honest, especially progressives and on the left, uh, being taken kind of flat-footed. There wasn't this rush to look at um, or to offer concrete proposals uh, better than the free market, given the economic collapse we've, we've uh, seen under COVID. COVID didn't cause the economic collapse, obviously, it's a virus. But it's certainly the free market, as we've been told for years and years and years, didn't save us. You know, it didn't help us. In fact, it's hurting us. It's not helping us in this time of shock to the system and time of such need. You know, the state is having to step in. And we've all seen different measures where the economy has, ha um, has had to be, quote unquote, fixed or aided or intervened in by the government, where governments have been, where a lot of businesses and folks have been saying for years, well, government's part of the problem, all right? You gotta get government out of the way. Well, not so as we've seen. And, um, and also people being able to, uh, <clears throat> to thrive and have the government uh, you know, in their lives with the CERB and those kinds of things. So we wanted to say, what else is there? What is there and how do we seize this moment? I would submit, and again, this is just a, you know, a rough comment, but we haven't seen this kind of economic difficulty, uncertainty, collapse, if you will, uh, since it, you know, the beginning of World War II, uh, especially in its depth. And at that point, again, to be kind of you know, rough about it, elites got together in a closed room and came up with Bretton Woods, and we have what's now turned into the global economy we have, with which there's so much dissatisfaction. Well, so my project, I was talking about and putting together through Harvard that you see on the screen is, okay, well, if alternatives or better ways are beyond our known and familiar, because we've been socialized with free by the free market system and free market values for so long, what do we do? How do we get a short list together and do something local at the community level 
as a demonstration project that then others can look to, can cite, and hopefully replicate moving forward and have this revolution, if you will, catch on, uh, hopefully like wildfire, that way. And so that's what brought us to this format today, this seminar. I wanted to get smart people together, people smarter than myself, uh, to talk about how we're able to find and define a short list of what a non-free market economy could look like. Not grand theories necessarily. There are also lots of ideas, but very specific concrete measures. You know, and to wrap up, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen this quotation recently. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their new world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And I find that not only inspiring, but quite affirming that bringing people together, having, as Heather mentioned, a grassroots people's economy initiative, project, campaign, organizing at the community level, uh, that we're on the, on the right track. Um, there's lots of resistance, of course, and uh, nothing is easy. And I think on Twitter, Sean Menard summed it up best when he said, when you push to change the old status quo, the status quo will push back very hard. Perseverance and courage are required to see the change we deserve. And of course, in the words to paraphrase Tommy Douglas, have courage, my friends. It's not too late to make a, to make a better Canada or in this case, a better Ontario, or start with Port the Lakes. So in saying all that, in setting up the stage, um, in the spirit of moving forward, I'd like to ask uh, Pierre Ducasse to be our first speaker. Pierre um, is from Quebec. He has done a lot on issues of post-secondary education, uh, local economic community development within Quebec. Uh, he's the author of a book on economic democracy, and uh, we're really happy that uh, Pierre is able to be here. So Pierre, would you like to uh, please share, share with us your wisdom? Okay, thanks so much. Is, uh, is the sound working okay? It is, hear you loud and clear. Well, fantastic. Uh, well, uh, thanks Mike for, for the invite. Um, I've known Mike for uh, some time and we've been together uh, discussing uh, many common fights that we have the fight for social justice, the fight for uh, community development, and the fight against hair loss. Um, I'm sad to say that uh, one of them seems to be lost. I still have faith on the two other ones. Um, currently, I'm, uh, I, even though I, I'm currently working in the labor movement, uh, in my past, uh, I was head of Quebec's uh, Community Development Corporations Network, uh, and, um, and uh, those were extremely, extremely happy days uh, for me working in community development. So thanks for the uh, opportunity. Uh, Mike asked uh, us to be very concrete, so I won't uh, be discussing just principles for 10 minutes, but I thought of just starting very, very quickly with a, a few principles. So again, uh, the question is, how do, what kind of economy do we want to build uh, after uh, this current crisis? Um, do we have the ability to learn from our mistakes and uh, think outside the box. And that's something that we, we could have done with the last crisis, the financial crisis 10 years ago. Sadly, I don't think we, we did. Uh, and that was a, an opportunity lost, sadly. And we just fell back into the same system we had before, the same system that caused the crisis. So in terms of principles, the, for me, the, the principles of, a, uh, uh, of this new uh, recovery that we want, I, 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 I brought it down to a list of five. We want a fair recovery um, with in, uh, uh, social inclusion. We want a green recovery, something that helps us tackle the, the challenge of climate change at the same time. We want a recovery that's rooted in community. Doesn't mean that other levels uh, are not important, but we do want local, uh, local um, uh, roots to everything we do. We want our recovery to be democratic uh, with, uh, with uh, more economic and social participation. And we, uh, coming out of this, we want to build a more resilient uh, economy. And uh, even though there's 20 or 30 different things that uh, I or, or others could talk about, uh, I decided today to talk about one specific angle, which is 
the question of uh, agriculture um, and, and, and food supply and food production. Uh, I won't pretend I'm an expert, but let's say just an informed amateur uh, that, that has started to uh, study uh, these issues more profoundly in, in the last few years. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I think it's fair to say that, um, that there can be no uh, there can be no sovereignty uh, when uh, w without uh, without some w without food autonomy. Um, you you need to uh, we need to look at the model that's more based on uh, self determination and self reliance, at least in terms of uh, of uh, of our food supply. So I I wanted to mention uh, a few of these examples. Again, could mention many others. There's uh, many other things that we could mention, but uh, again, Mike said, be concrete, bring some concrete examples. So I'm just gonna do that, uh, uh, do that right now. Uh, I got really interested in this when uh, I was uh, looking at, uh, I heard a reportage uh, uh, on the news about uh, initiatives that were happening actually in Detroit, uh, in, in some of the poorer uh, communities there, black communities, um, where they reappropriated part of, of unused lands and lots in the city and transformed them into community gardens. And more than community gardens now, uh, uh, you know, they actually uh, have tons and tons and tons of produce right now that's actually helping to feed uh, the people in the community, they're rooted in the community, and that's completely in an urban setting. So again, that's thinking outside the box, and it doesn't solve all problems, but when you, when you can go across the street to get your food, that's, uh, that's one, uh, one step towards uh, more autonomy, uh, and they're very, uh, it's a very inclusive, uh, uh, project, so I urge you to study more on that. Uh, at a conference recently, I had the chance, uh, this is another example, I had the chance to meet uh, with the deputy mayor of the city of Rennes uh, in France, and uh, they are, uh, as a municipality, they gave themselves the objective uh, within, I think it's 10 years or so, to be 90% uh, uh, self-sustaining autonomous in terms of food production and it actually started uh, by a university project uh, where students asked themselves the questions what would it take uh, in terms of production to feed our city and the is approximately a hundred thousand uh, people and what was what started as a university project became something that was embraced by the municipality the entire community and so what they're doing they're doing a mix of Urban farming, uh, they're asking uh, uh, owners of houses to plant fruit trees in front of their front yards, and then those fruit trees are available to the entire community uh, once the fruit uh, is ripe. And they estimated that they needed a belt of approximately 18 kilometers around the city, agricultural belt, to be able to feed the entire city. So, uh, and now this has become a, a, um, uh, a project. Uh, that rallies the community, and I think that's like just an incredible, incredible project. Um, closer to where I'm, I live right now. I'm just going to talk about the Utawe uh, Dairy. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, 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 a dairy that was closing down, and all of a sudden, new owners thought of maybe uh, buying it so that uh, the, the milk. Um, uh, harvested in the Utah be transformed and distributed in, in Utah and um, and what they did was they uh, it was a, a project that was partly led by a, a, a few private entrepreneurs but they wanted it to be more locally based and so they created a structure in which there was a worker shareholder co-op so that the future workers of that plant, be part of that, be part owners, and they also created a, uh, uh, with the help of, of, of community and co-op leaders, a um, uh, consumer shareholder co-op. So now we have this model, and and it and it's a uh, it's a great success. It it actually it, it worked. So this uh, this is an example because I really love the cooperative model, but this I've also started to love kind of these hybrid intermediary models. Uh, and Letri of Utaway is one of them, where it, part of the, it's a company, part of the share is its own privately, but part uh, in a way that's more democratic that involves the workers and the consumers. So that's an interesting possible model when, uh, 
when when it can be applied. Also uh, in the Utah, we have uh, what we call Marché de l'Utawe, the Utawe market. So what it is, it's it's a cooperative that you you become a member, but it helps you put uh, through uh, through the internet through a web uh, application. You can order online local produce produced by local farmers, local producers, and you can get basically anything chicken cheese uh wine fruit uh, vegetables of course and 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 basically everything so again uh, an interesting model in my mind of uh, something that yes there's the involvement of a small uh, the small business small farms but you they use a, a cooperative to help in the distribution so it has again a kind of a, a hybrid model there uh, where the the the, the co-op plays a super important uh, role um i currently work for a public uh, sector uh union uh qp and uh, but a few years ago i want to mention this example um uh, qpbc uh, led uh, a campaign called the 10% shift. And uh, uh, so basically president at that time, Barry O'Neill, touring the province, working uh, with uh, local chambers of commerce and small business to, uh, uh, to in a campaign to ask the public, you know, let's shift 10% of, 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 of what we currently buy in the uh, Walmarts or other uh, uh, global uh, companies. And let's, let's shift, uh, 10% of our income to buy local. So again, this is for me an, uh, an example of like a, a, an unlikely partnership. So it's a public sector union actually partnering with small business saying to the public, let's buy local and that's in everybody's, that's in everybody's interest. Um, so, um, uh, I, I, and I use the word unlikely partnerships because that's, that's what I learned from my years in community development. If we just talk among ourselves, if we just talk among the left, uh, you know, it's very nice, but you know, it, it, when you really want a community approach, you need to talk to the people that maybe ideologically are not similar to you, but you can still reach out on, on on specific projects and uh, right now i'm <laughs> for instance i'm 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 in talk uh, i i originally come from set on the north shore of quebec there's no agriculture there there's there's nothing uh more uh, industry uh, industry uh, based uh, region uh but i'm actually in chat with um actually a, a priest there and we want to maybe transform an unused part of a cemetery into an orchard uh, so again, this is like, we need to think outside the box sometimes. Uh, and I think, uh, and again, I, I could have talked about uh, dozens of other examples, but I think, uh, food sovereignty control, control over the, the food supply and how do we make that, uh, uh, in link with the principles that I said at the beginning, fairness, green, uh, community-based democratic and helping our resilience as a community. So uh, I'm trying to keep it short. I have my timer here and I'm, sh I'm looking forward to the discussion and thanks so much for, for the invite. Again, this is a, a real, real pleasure and thanks for, uh, congrats for the initiative to everybody. Thanks so much, Pierre. And uh, clearly this is an upside of using our technology and our Zoom webinars is that people are uh, able to join us from everywhere. It can really be a, you know, a people's economy event. And uh, Pierre, thank you for joining us from Quebec. Je dois dire aussi, si vous avez des questions en français, allez poser les et moi je ferai mon mieux après la traduction. So I want to make sure that people know that if uh, they have questions in French, please ask them and uh, I'll do some translation to be able so that we can uh, share them with the group. Uh, I see a few comments here. Kevin is talking about uh, 214 Alpha, um, an initiative out of Austin, Texas, here in the chat. Uh, it looks like it involves uh, international community design. And uh, Jolie Benz from here in Lindsay, I know has provided some uh, statistics and information there on food security um, so and, and food uh, availability. So fantastic. Thank you so much, Pierre, uh, for sharing your experience. And um, let's uh, keep moving along here. Our, uh, and again, please, uh, for those of you who are in attendance, the chat board is there, as you see. Please uh, engage as part of our, the format of our discussion so that we have access. And also the Q&A uh, is at the bottom there.
sorry. So next up we have uh, Rick Smith. Uh, I assume Rick is in Toronto today, uh, given given the state of uh, of Toronto and uh, mobility directives these days. Um, Rick is the executive director of the Broadbent Institute. He was also the past executive director of Environmental Defense Canada. And uh, his book, well, one of his books, Slow Death by Rubber Duck, um, has just been updated. I've got to give you a free plug for that, Rick. And it That's is available book. in many languages, uh, which I was encouraged to learn. So, Rick, thank you for, uh, for joining us. And uh, take it away with your, with your 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, it's a real, real pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks to Mike and to Trent for, for organizing this. This is, this is a great initiative, and frankly, this is such a, an important time. Uh, we need similar initiatives as this all across the country. So, you know, fantastic that we're focusing on the Quarthas today, but, uh, you know, here's hoping that, uh, that this, this discussion today serves as a kind of template for, uh, for similar discussions across the country. Um, so uh, Mike made me swear to stick to 10 minutes, uh, uh, which I'm determined to do. I don't know what happens to you if you go over 10 minutes, maybe uh, some terrible. There's a buzzer, Rick, and a, yes, and a, no, and a yeah. light shock. Right. Um, so i uh, suspecting that, that a lot of the other speakers were gonna zero in on specific ideas, proposals, I thought I'd approach this from a little bit of a different angle and talk a little bit about some of the research, uh, the uh, public opinion research that the Broadbent Institute has undertaken in the last couple of months to try to get a sense of how Canadians, uh, including in the Kawarthas, are feeling about this pandemic, what their priorities are, uh, and frankly, what people are up for in terms of, uh, in terms of rethinking our system and, and thinking about uh, what, a, what a COVID recovery looks like. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, share my screen here in one second and flip up just a couple of uh, really interesting results from a, a poll that the Broadman Institute did last month. Uh, you can find the complete poll and analysis on our website, broadbaninstitute.ca. So feel free to check that out. Uh, and also, um, Please, uh, please check out pressprogress.ca. That's our daily uh, news feed. Uh, uh, you can find that online. You can find it on Facebook and uh, Twitter. So let me just uh, flip this up here. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Is that working? Okay, let me, uh, there. Let, me, let me start here. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of polling uh, in the 10 years since the Broadman Institute was created. And, and I'm not sure I've ever seen uh, numbers, public opinion numbers as convincing as this. Uh, when it comes to an appetite for bold change. Uh, I'm going to skip to, rather than waiting to the end of my uh, few slides here, I'm just going to skip to to my punchline, uh, which is this. I, I think that most Canadians, it's clear that most Canadians have concluded as a result of this COVID experience that we need to make some significant changes to uh, to the way that we're organized as a country and the way that we take care of each other uh, and, and the way that we fund our public projects. Uh, and, and people are, are uh, somewhat dismissive of fiddling around at the margins, uh, some of the kind of uh, tweakings, minimal tweakings that, uh, that are on offer from governments at the moment and would like to see something bolder. So let me, let me start here. Uh, 75% of Canadians uh, would like to consider something like a wealth tax. And of course, uh, the federal NDP in the last election had a very uh, simple proposal uh, for people uh, with assets over $20 million. Uh, and, and so this, this notion of coming together and making sure that this pandemic 
doesn't adversely impact those most vulnerable amongst us and enrich people who are already rich. Uh, there's a real appetite out there uh, amongst Canadians to talk about this and to, to make our tax system fairer as we think about how to pay for COVID recovery and who pays. Here's another interesting uh, uh, number that speaks to the, the ambition uh, of, what, of what people would like to see. We, of course, Stephen Harper popped up uh, last week in the Wall Street Journal of all places, talking about how governments need to quickly return to austerity and we need to get you know, this, this kind of freewheeling COVID spending needs to end as soon as possible. Take a look at this, by a margin of two to one, Canadians say that governments should spend whatever is necessary to rebuild the economy and support those in need, even in the case of deficit. Uh, only 36% of Canadians say governments should reduce spending, get deficit in, uh, in control, even if recovery is slower, people don't get help. So in other words, uh, people get the fact that this uh, COVID recovery is gonna take a while. Uh, and that uh, the governments need to take the lead in, uh, in uh, moving that recovery along. 89%, incredible, 89% of Canadians think some improvements are needed to the availability of paid sick days and livable wages for all workers. Uh, and this is especially true among women and younger Canadians. So uh, this, this notion or this, this uh, fact that has, uh, become so evident through this, through this period that essential workers, those workers who are uh, often uh, most in harm's way during this pandemic, are some of the worst paid workers in the country. Uh, this has really sunk in for Canadians and the notion that, uh, that in fact, the, the mistreatment of these workers, uh, for instance, in long-term care homes, that result in uh, these workers having to take multiple jobs, uh, not staying home when they're sick, that, that the, the mistreatment of these workers actually endangers the health of all of us uh, when, when people, for instance, can't stay home when they're sick. Uh, so 89% of Canadians would like to see some fundamental changes in terms of paid sick days, livable wages, something that we need to push hard for as progressives in the months ahead. 77% of Canadians support governments providing financial assistance and debt relief to municipalities. Of course, municipalities are uniquely vulnerable as a level of government in Canada. Uh, they are, you know, constitutionally, they are creatures of, of provinces, unlike in the United States, uh, really constrained in terms of uh, how they can raise revenue. Uh, and yet, it's municipalities quite often that are on the hook to... Uh, uh, to house people, to, uh, to provide those frontline services that are literally saving people's lives, and yet municipalities uh, uh, are not able to raise the revenues required. So 77% of Canadians support governments providing financial assistance and debt relief to municipalities. Uh, and this is something that we're going to be digging into in the months ahead uh, to make sure that there's not sort of a one-off emergency bailout to municipalities, but some fundamental changes, a new deal for municipalities is, is required. Uh, this, I think, is my last number. Again, take a look at this. 97% of Canadians believe that our long-term care system uh, uh, for, for aging citizens needs improvement. Uh, we've dug into this a little bit. People buy the fact, people have absorbed the fact that for-profit long-term care homes have killed more people than, uh, than publicly run long-term care homes. Clearly there's a fundamental deficit in, in, in the for-profit sector of this industry that needs to be addressed. Uh, and this, this clearly needs to be a focus for progressives uh, in the months ahead. Uh, sorry, this is my last slide here. Uh, Look at these numbers. Building Canada's ability to produce key products like food and medical supplies here instead of relying on global markets. 44% of, of Canadians say this is extremely important. 35% say very important. 19% say it's important. Only 2% say it's not important. So um, all of a sudden, the notion that we need to make things in Canada again, we need to focus on our resilience as, as a province and as a country uh, and ensure that, uh, that our food supply is safe, 
that the supply of uh, key equipment like medical supplies is reliable, uh, all of a sudden this is back on the table as a key public policy issue and something that we need to uh, push forward together uh, in the months ahead. Um, so maybe I'll leave it there. Uh, just, to, just to reiterate my, my overall point that I think as, as progressives thinking about the next uh, few months and years, we have an obligation to, uh, to push successfully for fundamental structural change. Canadians are up for it. Canadians are looking for it. Uh, Canadians understand that, uh, that uh, those kinds of changes are important to secure our, our, our health and well-being. Um, so I look forward to generating more, generating more ideas today and to uh, Mike to, to coming, coming together with some concrete steps forward to do that. Great. Thanks so much, Rick. And thanks to the Broadbent Institute for that public opinion research. Uh, not all of us have that kind of reach uh, and resources at our disposal. So that is really, really helpful to be able to share. I see there's some sharing going on in the chat already, which is great. And uh, I find it particularly encouraging for those numbers, Rick, that we do seem to be on the, on the right track in that, you know, kind of penciling in, uh, you know, some, some small changes or, you know, maybe a few stronger social programs or some modest wins or gains in the existing system really isn't necessarily on. And as a big proponent of the basic income, I've been wondering late, of late, maybe as heresy, is that enough at this point? Should we be demanding, imagining, thinking bigger in terms of what we're able to obtain given the uniqueness and the urgency of these times? So, uh, so thanks very much, Rick. I just see one question. I'm gonna go to the chat just for a minute. Um, and um, one question that came up, Rick, um, maybe uh, you can uh, speak to the wealth tax. You know, um, Tanya's asking about uh, how do we in incentivize the wealthy to accept that kind of tax uh, and take up residency and not take up residency where there isn't a tax, like get out of the jurisdiction. Yeah. Well, very quickly, and you know, I look forward to hashing all this out, of, you know, later in the, in the day. But um, uh, you know, here's one interesting indicator of of the situation in Canada being so bad that even the wealthy are coming forward and saying, "Listen, we got to fix things." There's this, you should check out online. There's this great new movement of uh, wealthy young people called Resource Movement that started up. You can Google them. So they're they're the sons and daughters of wealthy families. Uh, this, this organization started in the States, just come to Canada. And their goal is to push for fairer taxation on themselves and their families. Uh, so we're, you know, we're looking forward to a, a healthy, uh, rip-roaring national debate on wealth tax because now is the time. I mean, the, the, the wealth, in, as, as Linda McQuaig has written about eloquently, uh, Wealth inequality in this country is so bad, people have a hard time wrapping their minds around it. Uh, the bottom 50% of income earners in this country own less than 10% of the assets in this country. So basically, the bottom 50% of income earners in Canada own nothing uh, in, in, in net terms. I and mean, it's just mind boggling. Uh, and of course, the, in the last couple of days, the new numbers from the parliamentary budget office have come out. And I mean, they're just astonishing. So I think now is the time to push for wealth tax. And what the federal NDP put forward in the last election is a great step forward. It was poo-pooed by all the pundits at the time. Uh, but it's very similar to uh, what Elizabeth Warren put forward in, in the United States. Great. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, and there was outrage last week when it's noticed that uh, Loblaw is going to cut uh, the, uh, its COVID. It's $2 an hour raise. Um, despite $240 million uh, of profit last, uh, last quarter. Again, along the lines you're talking about. I'm gonna try and find the link and post it there um, from some of the things that you've been talking about, Rick, especially with, I don't know, when I, grew up, when I was growing up, there was like almost a Canadian value around paying our fair share, you know, which I think has been so distorted now by the, you know, the globalized free market on steroids that uh, maybe there is a bit of a return to that and we can make a, a values proposition. Um, Nora, are, are you here yet? Nora Loretto from Quebec City. Okay, well, Nora hasn't been able to join us just yet. So, um, 
Dennis, why don't we move to you and we'll uh, we'll fit uh, Nora in when she's able to be here. Actually, uh, uh, Mike, Dennis Mike, Bielan Mike. is a professor at, in the political science department at York University and has done a lot of writing on um, economic democracy and the democratic and political aspects of, you know, I'd like, I don't want to set you up too much, Dennis, but what I'm finding of late is, what's the point of all this if we can't implement it politically? Um, and uh, so I'll turn it over to you, and I've got to say a, a pre-plug for the university. Uh, Dennis is a former Canada Research Chair in Canadian Studies uh, here at, uh, at Trent University. So uh, Dennis, for the next 10 minutes, the floor is yours. So I see Nora has joined us now. I don't know oh, if you want to okay. stick to the regular thing or if you want to just to switch it up. Sure, Nora, are you there? Hello, yes. Hi, fantastic. Would you like, we were just moving on in case you uh, didn't come right in. Shall we, would you like to speak or shall we go to Dennis first while you warm up? No, no, I've, I've been here all morning. Um, I, was, oh. I was just in, I think, as a participant rather than as a panelist. So uh, sorry, I have not Nora. missed sorry. anything. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to this day and age, right? When we have yeah. these glitches. Are yeah, you prepared exactly. to go then? Shall we, shall we turn the floor over to you? So let me introduce uh, everyone to Nora Loretto. Nora is uh, an activist and writer based in uh, Quebec City. And I think by her own uh, definition, she's a very mild and meek writer, I think people have found, um, yes. you know, which of course only serves to endear her to us. And uh, she's a contributor to Canada's National Observer and the editor of the Canadian Association of Labor Media. So uh, again, uh, Nora, welcome. Thank you for joining us from Quebec. And um, please, the, uh, the floor is yours So for some New economic thinking by the people for 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, this is such an important time to have this conversation because um, as has been alluded to, although I'm not sure it's been named yet, um, the moment that we're in obviously is, is very open for big ideas and bold change, uh, but the right wing is thinking in the same ways and they have access to decision makers and to politicians in a way that the left does not. And so as like, average people are seeing change and feeling change, I mean, my father uh, two days ago was saying to me, you know, well, this is, this is bearing the new era uh, and it's so great. Uh, but the problem is, is that average people don't have the same kind of power to define how this new era is going to be, um, how it's going to, to exist really. Um, and so my presentation is gonna talk about some concrete ideas, but also the things that we need to keep in mind when we're organizing. Uh, because now is the time that the new era will be built. Uh, and if we don't find ways as citizens to plug ourselves into uh, decision making and forcing politicians to take the right decisions, uh, we will find ourselves uh, in that world that Stephen Harper was talking about, that Rick was just talking about, um, where austerity will rule once again. Um, and so I think that it's really important um, the taxation wealth inequality issue, I, if, if, if Rick hadn't gone through all of that, I would have talked about that as well. Um, it's really, really critical. Um, and not just wealth for the, the ultra-rich, uh, taxes for the ultra-rich, but also finding a way to redistribute the wealth that has been passed on in this country based on uh, so the color of one's skin, right? I income inequality has been built into, uh, has, been, has been built off of white supremacy in Canada in a way that I think a lot of white people refuse to, to acknowledge or to talk about. Um, and the way that this happens is through uh, not taxing inheritance. Um, so not talking about giant mass amounts of wealth, like the folks within the resource movement uh, that Rick talked about, those folks are like trust fund kids with a lot of wealth, but, but more um, just having inheritance taxed uh, would, would help to really rebalance the forces of who has wealth in this country and who does not. Um, and so I, I say that because you know, I, I come from a family um, who uh, is able to make some money off of, of agricultural land in Ontario. I have a cousin who's on her side of the family, not my family, managed to sell their plot of land that was given to them for free in the 1800s for $7 million uh, for development. And I think that that's really common. Um, this entrenches a, a, a problem within our society that uh, gives access to wealth to some people that doesn't give access uh, to wealth to other people. And unless we figure out how to change that, uh, we will continue to uh, per perpetuate the same problems on, on which uh, this country has been built. In this moment, it's really, really important, I think, to, to start with long-term care. Long-term care is that thread that goes throughout this whole uh, crisis that um, lays bare the problems in the most clear terms. 
uh, we are at a situation where more than 7,000 people in Canada have died in long-term care as a result of COVID. That is 84% at least of all deaths. When you look at how we compare to other countries, uh, it's not good. I mean, Australia has had a fraction of the deaths that we have had in long-term care. Uh, the United States has had a fraction of, of the deaths that we've had in long-term care, although their deaths every, everywhere else are, are quite high. But I think that we need to stop and say, how did a country that prides itself on having public health care uh, create a situation where this, this virus would be so deadly within long-term care? Um, Rick talked about it a bit, uh, the private system, but I have to uh, kind of push against that because it actually is not just the private system. It's certainly the private system in Ontario, but if you look at Quebec, the majority of the deaths have happened in public care. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is it about the way that we've organized long-term care and caring for people who are the most vulnerable that has created the situ that situation that we're in? And it's market driven, it's, pri uh, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, I'm thinking in French here, <laughs> it's looking for the funds, uh, looking for the profits or looking for the savings, whether that's in the public sector or the private sector, as a way to try and fund what is really an expensive uh, care system. And if we're going to fund this expensive care system properly, if we're going to fund it the way that we fund our hospitals and fund other parts of the healthcare system, it's going to cost a lot of money. And so we also have to start talking about uh, taxes as a way uh, to fund these things, restoring that uh, as Mike had started off at the beginning, restoring that pride and paying our taxes to be able to have the, the kind of funds that we need to, uh, to, to fix these issues. And long-term care touches on so many issues, like the need to have local manufacturing uh, reinvested in this country. And I think that based on the, 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 the small communities that many of you folks are, are in, or maybe uh, mid-sized towns, we can look at different opportunities for manufacturing, for rebuilding our, our, our systems that are, that are really, um, that could be innovative and that could help resist some of the problems that have laid bare uh, throughout this crisis. Uh, part of that, of course, is also free higher education and free daycare. Uh, we don't really talk about free daycare very often, but daycare, of course, looks a whole lot like uh, grade one and kindergarten care, which we already have in this country as being totally free. Uh, and so does first year university or college. Um, there's really no reason why all of these things are costing money. And we need to really be, 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 be doing what we can to, to force our politicians to make sure that they understand that we see a public good in these, in these public services. And the final thing that I would just want to mention quickly, sorry, two things, and I think I may maybe only have a little bit more time here. Uh, you got is, a couple minutes, Nora, you're good. Well, I also want to talk about something else. Okay. <laughs> Thank Happy you. Happy planet off. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, is, is the need for us to, to, recon, to reconsider how we uh, have media in this country and the need for local media. So what kind of community responses can we have to create local, uh, local news? Uh, and not just news that uh, might put forward a progressive vision of the country, that I think that's really important. But we also just need to reinvest and find ways to, to, to even buy back our local news channels from for-profit providers. I think it's very clear that, that there's a crisis in mainstream news right now in this country. And part of that crisis is that it's, it's almost entirely private, with of course some exceptions, the CDC being, being a big, a big um, exception, exception. But we have to, um, we have to find ways to, to purchase media, to own media, and to make our own media. Um, I have a podcast uh, that's called Sandy Norv Talk Politics. And it's been very interesting to see how thirsty people are to have uh, alternative forms of analysis. Uh, but it's not just analysis that we need. We also just need the day-to-day the, the -day coverage of city council or town council, of obviously the provincial government. And so I really encourage folks to think about, are there ways in your local community that you can create news uh, or purchase uh, dying news outlets that might be in your community that, uh, that currently are, are held for profit? And then the big, of course, piece that we absolutely need to talk about, because when we talk about where's all the money going and where are we going to get money for these ideas, is the movement to defund the police. I think that this is such an important movement. The fact that, that, that tens and tens of thousands of Canadians have been out in the streets talking about defunding the police is really, really important. And the, the money that goes into policing, of course, a lot of it will have to be reallocated for other kinds of security services that, that might be able to address some of the things that police do in our communities. But the reality is, it, it, when we're talking about poverty, and we're talking about poverty being one of the, the sources of, of, of creation of, of crime, 
prevention of crime has to be talking then about reducing poverty. And so that goes back to free higher education, free daycare, local food systems, like as, as Kian was talking about earlier. And so um, I really encourage you to get involved in local movements to defund the police. I mean, I'm from Georgetown, Ontario, and a thousand people protested against the Halton police, which is like, I've never, like, I can't even, I'm not even sure there's been a protest against racism in Georgetown that's been bigger than maybe a hundred people. So, you know, something is happening here. And so for the final couple of minutes, what I want to talk about is why is there a disconnection between these great ideas and actually creating change? Because the reality is, is that, you know, a lot of organizations have the blueprint for what we need to create change, but there's a disconnect between that blueprint and how we actually create change. Um, and my podcast this week, uh, Sandy and I talked about the, the barriers that we're up against in trying to actually force politicians into creating change. Um, you know, of course we have, we have the NDP, a lot of their recommendations are not strong enough. Like we are in a situation where we really do need to be calling for maximum program to be able to cut through the, the rhetoric of the liberals, because otherwise we fall into the same trap that the liberals set. Um, and we've got a liberal party that has literally done nothing on a lot of the issues that they promised to, well, certainly the issues that they got elected on, um, but the issues that, that they were most um, making people excited over, especially in 2015, the liberals have just been so abysmal. We have a crisis of democracy right now. And that crisis of democracy means that there is a disconnect between how average people uh, 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 express their desire for political change and how politicians respond to political change. And so there's two ways that we can go about creating political change. The first is that we do it ourselves and we just create those community gardens. We just create those cooperatives. We just buy the local newspaper and set it up as a, as a not-for-profit or as a cooperative or whatever. Those are possible and there's lots of examples of that across Canada and around the world. But we also do need to find a way to restore democracy in that our politicians are afraid of average people. Politicians actually hear when thousands and thousands of people come into the streets and start thinking about how do we come up with ways that does force them into the, the, the kinds of changes that we want to see uh, that we want to see on the ground. So I think I'll leave it there. Fantastic. Good. Okay, great. And sorry about the Thanks, questions uh, that I didn't I get to. Uh, that's a perfect setup, I think, for Dennis uh, coming in next in terms of our, you know, political and democratic cr uh, crisis. And thank you for naming uh, white supremacy and I would add colonialism to part of the disconnect uh, that we're seeing, the systemic issues that uh, are causing, causing these issues and the resistance uh, to change. And for offering those, you know, concrete items as well in terms of, you know, diverting funding from police. Uh, those long-term savings we can see that we like to talk about in Canada, but don't really like to implement so much. Uh, I was doing a youth forum yesterday and uh, for Peterborough, and I found a stat where we spend more public money in Ontario on private education than several of our OECD uh, fellow countries. You know, so, so again, it comes back, I think, to that issue of priorities and... Uh, Nora, thanks for that. Uh, you want a shout out in the chat, by the way, from Kevin, who's also from Georgetown, uh, and was at the march that you mentioned. Uh, so well done. In the interest of time, we do have a question and answer session and an open discussion. I'll come back to the chat. But uh, I want to turn it over now to Dennis, because it was such a good segue on um, the political system and the political crisis. So uh, Dennis, from York University, please uh, take it away. All right, well, thanks, and, and thanks, Mike, for asking me to uh, be a part of this. For being um, here. You know, I haven't done a great deal of work on economic democracy. As you say, I'm, I'm more focused on uh, democracy and democratic reform and, and, you know, what I call the struggle over actually existing democracy, which is sort of recognizing that what we've managed to accomplish in Western countries isn't really that democratic. Uh, and it's not that democratic because at its founding, uh, there were considerable forces that didn't want it, uh, didn't want us to be democratic, and they've continued to not want us to be democratic, and they continue to struggle to take any democracy out of the processes. Uh, they love to have processes, but they, they like them you know, under their control, uh, and with as little substantive democratic um, activity going on as possible. So yeah, I, I wanna talk about you know, how do we get from the ideas to the action? Uh, because we don't lack for great ideas. Uh, we got libraries full of great ideas. Uh, it's not a question of, you know, some brilliant person coming up with our answers. Uh, that's, that's not our problem. So part of the reason why I've looked at democratic reform, um, uh, and particularly, you know, proportional representation, 
is because it breaks the winner take all mentality that our undemocratic voting system, which is very much a leftover from the pre-democratic era, our first past the post voting system, it, it gives all the power to the group that can get the most votes and it suffers from being not very representative. Uh, and those two factors are, are really a key part of the problem. Um, uh, where we see countries that have proportional systems, they are more democratic. That's, you know, there's not really any real debate over that, despite what you might hear. Um, and it, PR systems are more democratic because they're more representative. Uh, they're more representative in terms of our social diversity. Uh, they're more representative in terms of our ideological diversity. And that's good because one, it prevents a winner take all situation. So nobody has all the control. People have to actually work with other groups. Um, and it prevents uh, agenda control. That is really crucial. Uh, agenda control is really an important part of, the, of, of what's going on. Now, of course, anytime we've tried to get towards PR in this country, it has been strenuously resisted by the powerful. So, uh, so that tells you why it's important. Um, I wanna focus on the political work that I think uh, all of us will need to do if we want to move this agenda forward of a more people's economy. And part of that political work is to prevent the traditional agenda control whereby you know, the normal talking heads and the normal parties tell us that we can't have what we want. Um, now, one way to do that, of course, would be if we could get PR, but it seems unlikely. Uh, and it seems unlikely, particularly at the local level, though- Do you expand it's PR just for, for the attendees, Dennis? Sure. When I say PR, I mean proportional representation, which is just a voting system that says that if a party gets 20% of the votes, he gets 20% of the seats. This is the system that most Western countries use, uh, most Western European countries, uh, all the countries that we see as being fairly progressive, the Scandinavian countries, all of them use proportional voting systems. It's not a be all end all, it won't solve all our problems, but it does break open the traditional forms of political control. So, um, now, it's interesting in Ontario, you can actually introduce a proportional voting system at the local level, could be an interesting campaign for, for local activists to take up, though as we've already seen, it will be staunchly resisted by the traditional power brokers. Um, so what do we need to do? Well, we need to mobilize the constituency and have a mobilized constituency that can resist what I call the politics of the spectacle. Now, the politics of the spectacle is pretty much how politics runs in our, our conventional political system. And what that means is non-direct politics. For most people, politics is the politics of the spectacle. They consume their politics through media of one form or another, whether it's television or radio or, or social media. And what's, in, what's important about the politics of the spectacle is controlling people's perceptions of what is legitimate and what is not legitimate. Um, and you counter that by mobilizing people. You mobilize people uh, to discover that in fact, a lot of people actually want something other than what they're being offered. Um, the issue isn't the issues. Uh, we're often led to believe in politics that the issues that people are fighting about the issues, but in fact, what we discovered is that a lot more people are interested in the kind of progressive issues that this forum is talking about than we've been led to believe. So the issue isn't the issues, that people don't support the issues. The issue is what I would call the performance of possibility. People tend to want what they think they can get. I think that's important to focus on that just for a minute. People tend to want what they think is already possible. So the performance of possibility, uh, getting past the agenda control, letting people see that there are different ways of doing things, that other places have in fact introduced other ways of doing things is really, really crucial. If people have it, then maybe we have to answer, how come they've got it? And why can't we have it? That gets around some of those who would want to control the agenda and tell us that we, we can't have what we want. So basically, uh, you know, my, my, the gist of my comments are that if we want to move forward this idea of a, of a people's economy, one, we have to recognize that there will be serious and protracted opposition to this from all the usual players, from all the usual forces of opposition. They don't want this because it will interfere with their control and their ability to profit from other people's misery and other people's work. So it's going to be really important that ad, an organization exists that can do uh, two important things. 
One, it can showcase concrete examples of the goals that we have set for ourselves. Never underestimate the power of a concrete example. You know, we're all seeing on Facebook examples of uh, social housing in Austria, where they've got these fabulous social housing, and none of the typical attributes of social housing that we hear applied to social housing in North America are being applied to these examples in Australia. Austria, rather. Why not? And uh, so exploring that, examining how did Austrians get this is a necessary first step to opening people's minds to the possibility right here. So a group that can showcase concrete examples of possible futures and, and why can't we have them is really important. And I would argue that this mobilization on the local level can see a group of people act like a party that's not a party. Now here in Ontario there are various rules that prevent groups from running locally as a party which is kind of BS um, but nevertheless that's the way things are. But you can have a party that's not a party. You can have a party that operates to organize people locally and um, intervene in the way that a party might uh, in terms of the things that it would put on the table. And so what I would see this party that's not a party doing uh, is one, of course, putting forward these concrete examples. And that does two really crucial things. One, it prevents agenda control. A considerable amount of traditional politics happening at the level of the spectacle is to control the agenda. Make people think this is all that's on offer. You can only have A or B. You can only have Tweedledum or Tweedledon't. Uh, so preventing agenda control is crucial to opening up that, that political discussion. And then the performance of possibility. The performance of possibility is letting people know that it's possible. The things that they say they want, they can actually have. Whereas those who want to control the agenda, a key part of what they're doing is telling you that you can't have what you want. You know, we saw this on a whole host of, of issues. And of course, Rick can probably speak to this more, more directly in terms of some of the changes that we've seen in polling. But, you know, a really good example that I use with my students is the remarkable public uh, changes in opinion around things like gay marriage. You know, gay marriage was like, never going to happen. That's just crazy talk. There's no way that people are going to go for this. And yet we saw an almost volcanic change in public opinion. And what happened there was that as more people realized that other people were prepared to support this, they were more willing to admit that they supported it too. So it's really, really important that there is a public demonstration of the possibility that people can see that the agenda is more open than they believe and that they can in fact have the things that they want. Because all of this then contributes to legitimacy. It's legitimacy that these different groups are fighting over. In the public, when people put for their ideas, the first thing we'll hear from the right is that it's not legitimate, it can't happen, you can't believe these people, which is why a mobilized counterforce is absolutely crucial. And I think this is something that can be done at the local level, can be it can be organized locally, but it can have a much broader purchase on the political imaginary in terms of the various things that people want. Uh, a lot of the things that we want have to be accomplished at the national level or the provincial level, but there's an awful lot that we can do at the local level. And the local level is where the rubber hits the road. It's where just average folks who maybe don't make politics their main thing will, will tend to encounter politics. So the local organizing can have ripple effects well beyond. So I'll just leave my comments there. I realize they're, they're kind of vague in a way, and in some ways they just sort of offer up some traditional motherhood statements. But nonetheless, I, I think they're true. And I think they, they, they should be I a mean, priority. Not only are we hearing specifics today, but as Nora and Pierre touched on as well, uh, we're hearing some ways of getting there, right? And I found that particularly affirming, uh, Dennis, because that's what this demonstration project was supposed to be doing uh, for us here in Coworth Lakes showing the possible, doing the performance, as you say. Uh, look at blue boxes. Ah, uh, no one's gonna put a blue box out. No one's ever gonna recycle. And now we take them for granted and people saw them, right, on different people's uh, end of their driveway or in the neighborhood. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's fantastic work. So, uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, I wanna uh, move on as I'm gonna exercise some uh, uh, moderator privilege here. And I think in the interest of time, what we'll do is we'll hear from um, our remaining speakers, including Linda, and then we'll have a break in the next 15 minutes and then fold everything in to a broader uh, 
all round round table discussion. I still see that we have, you know, close to 70 people hanging on. So people are still awake. The numbers are, are still there. So um, up next, I'd like to introduce uh, Peggy Shaughnessy. Peggy is a PhD candidate at the uh, School for the Study of Canada at Trent, has done a lot of work um, countering addictions and addiction treatment, and also um, uh, being engaged with uh, Indigenous people within the criminal justice system. She's the owner of Red Path uh, Consulting and the Whistle Stop Cafe in Peterborough. Head on down to the Whistle Stop when you're in town. And um, also, uh, she is of both Irish and Haudenosaunee um, descent. And um, quotes in her bio that she has uh, benefited greatly from a lot of years of listening and uh, responding to elders. And so we look forward to uh, you, Peggy, sharing some of your wisdom on, on ways of being. I know here uh, in our area, as I, as I was saying, there certainly was a lot of an agrarian, agrarian economy and um, indigenous trade. Uh, you, gotta, you gotta move those canoes when the, when the settlers arrive. Uh, so I'd be interested, very interesting to see, uh, you know, what you uh, would like to talk about, including perhaps some uh, that you've learned from elders on indigenous ways of being uh, economically. Peggy. Good morning. Um, the, the, you know, we all have that COVID hair and uh, um, <laughs> everything. So bear with me on this. When Mike asked me to speak today, I often wondered where I fit into these conversations. Um, it's a great privilege to be part of the School for the Study of Canada. At my age, I'm sure I'll be the oldest student ever to, if I get through it, to uh, graduate from Trent University in the PhD program. Um, I think where my concentration was um, when Mike asked me, and probably into this morning, trying to figure out what the heck I was going to talk about today, is to always be um, aware of where essentialism and romanticism intersect. And, and also, I think in, in the areas that we work in, all of us, um, where theory um, comes into practical. And, and I think, you know, as academics and, and scholars, we tend to always talk in that theoretical sense and often forget about that practical. I, I have to applaud everyone that has spoken before me here today because, um, and I want to applaud Mike, um, because we've, we've seen both sides. We have, you know, everyone that spoke here already this morning, we have, you know, people talking about not-for-profit and for-profit, you know, and, you know, for somebody like me that um, has what I call a social enterprise, um, listening to what I think often in society gets confused with when one is talking about corporations and us small social enterprises get sort of pushed in with that conversation. And, and for me, working in the area of addictions as a business, I, uh, there's always resistance against, against me for being in an area that's a not-for-profit area. And so um, my talk today is more not sort of jumping on the not-for-profit, you know, Nora sort of defended sort of, and I don't think she defended, but that we always have to remember that the not-for-profit also in the elderly um, deaths and that through this COVID, all, it wasn't just the, for the profit. So we, we have to always be aware of how we're putting things out there because we're, we're not just attacking that 1% that is making millions and millions of dollars. It's also hurting small businesses like mine that is trying to make change within an industry that is just for not-for-profit. And so looking at my own business um, and, and how I started was coming out of my master's degree and when looking at Indigenous men in the federal prison system, there was a gap in services for them to come back out into the communities and to help with the reintegration. So I, I, I always say that I'm this gap provider. And I think that going out of COVID, we need to look at the gaps and we need to look at, I think, um, the whole industry of not-for-profits. And we need to look at them in a way that, um, I, I believe that it's created a classism. So, you know, a, a business that's open nine to five, Monday to Friday, um, that, mainly works um, with the lowest minorities in our societies. And so th those groups of people are forced to go to not-for-profits where middle class and upper class get to go to their counselor and that and pay for it. And so there's a division then, and I would argue a classism where not-for-profits have been created to fill a gap that hold a group of people 
um, in, in an area where money flows to agencies rather than to the citizens themselves in, in that um, group. And our concentration continues to fall upon um, the classism on minorities rather than breaking down the barriers that continue that divide. And, and I think that if we're going to have um, equality and if we're going to have inclusion and we're going to have all of those things, then we have to break that whole system down. Um, that, um, you know, it, it, it can't be that mentality of it's just these people and these people. Um, we do have a divide right across. And I think that, you know, in my first comprehensive exam, I looked at professionalism, or maybe it was my second comp, and looking at how professionalism came about and how um, you saw the not-for-profit then take over for the churches and then the state. Then, um, you know, you have the body that, that follows you to make sure you're following ethics and standards and all of that, which then is attached to the government. So not-for-profits actually are, uh, uh, align right to the government because they're relying on that funding and they're relying on this thing and they have to do what they're told and so i think for me in, in the addictions field we have to be really cautious about that because white privilege continues to dictate who is allowed to partake in the service game and and organizations and boards connection they're connected with the bureaucracy of the government for my own business i've had more problems with the bur bureaucracy and those civil servants than I, than I have for the ruling government because it's it's those civil servants and that make the decision. It isn't the government that we elect, it, it's those people that have been in place for 30 years. And so, all, like, how do you break that system, that framework down um, as we move forward? I, I don't have the answers for that, but they decide the models and, the, and accepted who's gonna be funded. So through that whole thing becomes this group of people that have control of how society's gonna run. And, and I think that's the area that I believe that, that really needs to be broken down and, and the barriers. For instance, for me, I've crossed Canada and I've, I've learned from many elders in many communities across the country that I've visited and I've worked with. But yet when I come back and, and give those ideas, then, you know, I'm, a vi I'm never a visionary. I'm always, oh, those are great ideas, but are really far-fetched. And, and, and those ideas don't fit in the current models. So that model then is never accepted, even though you have judges and you have all these people that say that they've never seen such change. But the people that are even in our own city in the power positions continue to fight against you because it's not the model um, that, that is getting funded and, and you don't fit within um, that body that's a not-for-profit and you're not supposed to be there. So I think that for, for the group, you know, you know Mike, you, you fought for to try to get the monies back for the people that were given money by the wind government to for the to, to live properly every day and um you know we we tend to um decide how how a group of people or minority groups of people are going to um survive but i think we need to go one step further it, it isn't how one survives it's how if we're going to talk about equality then what is that and and how does that system look and how can that person walking beside you um, be at the same level as you. Yeah, we can talk about, you know, education. Maybe everybody doesn't want to be educated. You go to the James Bay, maybe they want to learn about plants and, and uh, you know, live off the land and, and not be lawyers, but then they become a statistic that they're undereducated in, in the system that we have right now. And so we have to be really, really careful on our ideals and what other people's ideals are in order to see what is equality and, and what um who, where the um focus should be on i guess and, and for the addictions you know um we all have with the covid right now have seen even an increase in deaths with opioids in, in our country um we've had probably more deaths for opioid overdoses or poisoning than we have for covid um during this time um and i'm not trying to take away from covid but for us for the fight and for how that has to change as we move forward, always has that resistance. And, and so to me, if we're going to add anything to the um, system or better the system as we move out of this, I think we have to move beyond that medical model and we need to step back and stop looking at addictions as if there's no solution. And if we are ever to empower people, we need to look at treatment goals through a different lens um, if we should include, and we, it should not only include recovery from addiction, but also restoration of full functioning and passion for living, 
the recovery process needs to move from healing of addictions and brokenness to personal transformation and full integration into society. And that full integration has to be that they're living equally to everybody else in society, you know? And so um, I think for me, and it's sort of different than most people that are here today is I'm working um, in an area that, you know, you give some methadone or, or you, you get a um, consumption site so you can inject, but nobody's really looking at the recovery and, and looking at the recovery past um, that you're going to be an addict your whole life. It's looking at it that I can live in, in society without ever thinking about addictions. Um, so I think as we move forward, we have to look at all of those areas. And I think um, breaking down silos, we've talked about that for a long, long time. What does that look like? Um, you know, where does the money flow? Um, that's always a, a program. Who takes charge? Who tears down the empires that have taken 150 years to build upon? Um, and so all of those things are things that we need to look, look at as we move forward um, because it's like a two-headed snake and, and you wonder which end you're supposed to start at. And, it, and it's a big, big thing. And is it, uh, rom are we romanticizing and, and how can it happen? How can it really happen? And, you know, how can we as a group move forward from this conversation and show change at all levels of society rather than from top down. And you talk about going from bottom up and where are those voices? Great, thanks so much, Peggy. Thanks for those very uh, poignant points and reminders, especially around thinking bigger as well. You know, I was on some calls and I was kind of surprised with uh, some, some progressives in chatting about, well, you know, um, can we think bigger than this? Can we go for, for, for more forward than simply kind of tinkering with the system? And it's like, yeah, well, that sounds good, but what do you mean? Uh, you know, give us examples. What are you talking about? And then we go right back to the discussion of, you know, can we change the Income Tax Act to be more progressive, right? And again, I think it's outside of the known and familiar for so much of our socialization. So, Peggy, thanks very much for, for that reminder. And uh, especially the points of that, making sure it's about all of us. Right, and uh, making sure we're all there. Um, so um, moving on, then we'll hear from David and then wrap up with Linda McQuaig and then have a two or three minute coffee slash stretch break. That'll put it at the hour and a half point uh, for our break. And then we'll have plenty of time as long as people can stay to have an open discussion, pose some questions that I'll moderate. And then uh, maybe talk a little bit, Peggy, thank you for raising that point what might we be able to do from here? I've seen some comments. I just got an email actually uh, from Tony Pickard in Kingston um, talking about you know, this being such a solid foundation. Uh, so how do we uh, keep going from there? So uh, David Langell is our next uh, speaker. Uh, David is, uh, he teaches at York University as well. He has a very renowned uh, future of work course, but today he's with us as a climate change uh, activist. He's also the former executive director of the uh, Center for Social Justice in Toronto and uh, all around known, known activists. So uh, David Landrell, welcome. And uh, please um, take it away for 10 minutes. Is your mute on, David? I think your mute is on. Let me unmute you with the master power here. There you are. Oh, you're back on mute. Mute. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I think economic recovery should start close to home. That's where I'm coming from, most of us today as well. I'm going to offer you something that you can do without waiting for politicians to act. It's critically important. The current pandemic is horrifying, but fewer than 9,000 Canadians have died, and less than a half million globally, and the world of 8 billion people. There's a far larger problem. Respected scientists have said that we're now on track for the sixth extinction of life on Earth. Now, how is that possible? Well, as many of you know, but I'll just repeat for those who don't, over the last 200 years, we've burned a significant portion of the decayed vegetable matter that's accumulated since the origins of life on Earth. Those fossil fuels took hundreds of millions of years to accumulate underground, but for the last 200 years, we've been burning them 
at a faster and faster rate, 100 billion barrels of oil a day. But before those reserves run out, we'll have cooked our planet. The burning of fossil fuels produces 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. And that greenhouse gas is trapping more and more of the sun's heat in our atmosphere to the point where we're gonna cook if we don't stop. So the solution I'm suggesting is to start at home. We all need housing. We all need to keep warm in what's often a cold climate and keep cool in what's often a hot climate. So there's the problem I wanna tackle. How can we heat and cool our homes without burning fossil fuels and save the earth in the process? Across the planet, more than 28% of greenhouse gas emissions derive from the energy use in buildings. And here in Canada, it's interesting to note, homes and buildings that contribute only 12% of Canada's emissions. Now, we might wonder why the discrepancy. It's because of Canada's oil and gas sector and transportation sector. They're the largest emitters of greenhouse gases in Canada, and they account for over half of total emissions. That's a political problem we'll come to in a minute. Can big business solve this problem? The oil companies earned $1.6 trillion last year. Since 1990, they've made nearly $2 trillion in profits. Their shareholders have invested in perpetuating the problem. You know, their lobbyists uh, in Ottawa are reported to be hitting on our top politicians five times a day. So I don't trust business to fix this problem. So what can we do at the community level? I live in a little community on the east end of Toronto. We call it the pocket. We have 3,500 people in 1,100 homes, but many of those people are concerned about the environment. Our pocket community association has supported the creation of a pocket change project with 110 members. And we've come up with a lot of good ideas. We aim to ret retrofit our houses so as to live sustainably without reliance on fossil fuels and meet our energy needs from renewable sources. And we've experimented with several forms of community engagement, annual eco fun fairs, annual pocket community parties, pocket change parties in private homes where we introduce neighbors to the ABCs of home retrofits, and meetings of pocket trailblazers where homeowners share details of their home retrofitting experiences. These experiences have been shared on our website and Facebook page, flyers and posters and articles in the community, and now magazine, um, as well as being captured on, a progress, on an impressive video. Now, experts familiar with the lack of progress on home retrofits agree that the major obstacle is not financial or technical, but a problem of social or political will. How do you convince homeowners to invest substantially in improving their energy efficiency so as to lo lower their greenhouse gas emissions. Julia Langer, the CEO of the Atmospheric Fund, asks the important question, why aren't building retrofits trending already? And she suggests that the building sector needs a one-stop shop, a tailored concierge-like experience. And that explains why our focus is to convince and make it easy for homeowners to improve their energy efficiency so as to lower their greenhouse gas emissions. This is in the pocket, David? Yes. And we're now ready to offer a community-based approach to home retrofits that covers the eight steps from soliciting interest to approving final payment. The two key components is the way we build interest and motivate homeowners. And secondly, this idea of a Community Enterprise Retrofit Delivery Center, a one-stop local shop to offer advice and supervise the actual work, which would make it easier to supply the retrofits. So we're planning to do deep retrofits on all of our homes over the next 10 years, so as to get our community to net zero emissions without needing gas to heat our homes. That's what it means. And while it's okay to start with something small and practical, realist and feasible, the big challenge for all of us really is to scale up our good ideas. And for that, we need good governance. Now we're lucky, we're wise perhaps, to have elected supportive politicians at the city, provincial and federal level. This is Leighton Land, I'm speaking to you from. The city gave us 
$10,000 in recognition of, for us being one of the three greenest communities in the city. And that enabled us to ramp up our social engagement. The province gave us 20,000 and then Doug Ford, when he got elected, he ripped up the contract and he ripped up our application for $3 million to take our homes right off fossil fuels. He's not our friend or yours. <laughs> Last year, the federal government promised one and a half million energy audits and $40,000 interest, interest-free loans, but they've not delivered as yet, and we've got to keep them to that promise. Community groups like ours are good for spreading ideas, for social engagement, that offer fun ways of learning and for supplying peer pressure. But we need social enterprises and governments to help us scale things up and make things affordable. And we need governments and social enterprise to develop the workforce to train our young people and retrain others to do the job so we can retrofit all 12 million households in Canada. And we've got to do it in the next 20 years. So it's a huge job. Mike, I know you're looking for specific non-free market economic measures that can be implemented by December of 2021. That's a year and a half away. My advice is for everyone in the city of Kawartha Lakes to pick up a gun, like this one here. This is a caulking gun. <laughs> Air sealing your home is probably the most easy and affordable way to improve the energy efficiency of your home. This is the first and most important step in any retrofit project and will save you up to 30% of your energy costs. So I, there's your, your objective. You can do it in the next year and a half. You can encourage the city of Kawartha Lakes to help everyone install a heat pump. That's a more substantive, that would, that would really move you up the ladder. So to sum up, the benefits of working locally, it's a great way to learn uh, and have fun in the process. It helps us develop our capacities so we can tackle the big problems. It helps get friends and neighbors involved and build a bigger movement. The trick is to start locally though and expand nationally then globally. And at every level we have to elect progressive politicians who will support the socialist agenda. Don't be afraid to use the S word. The pandemic is showing how socialism saves lives. Compare the situations in Scandinavia and British Columbia, even with that of America or Brazil. My case is made. Thank you very much. Thank you, David Langell, for uh, your excellent making of the case and for uh, such concrete and local uh, specifics, especially sharing your um, initiatives there in your neighborhood in the pocket, which is an area of Riverdale, uh, in and around Riverdale uh, in Toronto. And um, in addition to the S word, David also used uh, what I find in, in activism and organizing to be the F word, fun, right? What's the, what's the, uh, uh, the quotation? I want no part of your revolution if I can't dance, right? Uh, Emma Goldman. So um, thank you very much, David. And uh, our last presenter uh, needs no uh, introduction, of course, uh, to most of us, uh, Linda McQuaig. Linda, thank you for joining us today. Um, Linda is a journalist and an activist. Uh, she supports workers and oppressed people and animals oppressed on uh, imprisoned in factory farms. Uh, her latest book is called The Sport and Prey of Capitalists. And um, of course, Linda has a wide, wide audience for her books on how to make a more egalitarian distribution of uh, both wealth and power. And, um, you know, the National Post. <laughs> consider the source, has referred to Linda as the Michael Moore of Canada. And I'd love to hear what Linda thinks of, uh, of that moniker. So uh, without further ado, Linda, thanks again for being here. And uh, we look forward to, to you taking home our panel here. So then we'll have a break and uh, open it up when we come back to a wide ranging discussion and input from our audience. Linda McQuaig. Well, thanks very much, Mike. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, and that uh, description of me as the Michael Moore of Canada by the National Post, I can assure you they meant that as an insult. <laughs> also gendered too, I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, it is great to be here and what a lot of interesting ideas have come out so far 
so I guess I want to pick up on the idea of the pandemic as this great opportunity for change, which we're all kind of excited about. Um, I mean, it strikes me that one of the most basic things that the pandemic has changed is public attitudes about government. You know, for the past few decades, the business community has been so focused on the idea of denigrating the whole notion of government and always encouraging the idea that the private sector can always do things better. Uh, and in fact, we hear, you know, we've heard that line, the private sector always does things better. It's always asserted with tremendous confidence and never with any evidence, however. In fact, the evidence suggests the private sector doesn't always do things better. It often does things much worse, uh, certainly ignoring the public interest and at greater cost to the public. Um, just if I can quickly mention my book that Mike mentioned, The Support and Prey of Capitalists, I focus on the, I think, the little known history of Canada as a very impressive public enterprise country. Uh, in other words, a country that not only has built some impressive social programs, well, most notably public health care, but has also built some very impressive public enterprises. And by that, I mean, you know, our power plants, National Railway, National Broadcaster, a, a wonderful publicly owned pharmaceutical company. And yet, after having done all that, in recent years, we've either dismantled or privatized most of those great public enterprises. Um, so that's my book, and I hope you'll all take a look at it. Um, but what I'm going to talk today about is how the pandemic has, if anything, just simply highlighted the foolishness of all that privatization we've been doing in recent years. Uh, I mean, not only does the private sector not always do things better, but we see in a pandemic how utterly the private sector fails us. Uh, you know, if we relied on the private sector, we'd all be in desperate situation. What has made the pandemic survivable is that government has expanded its spending dramatically. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that everything has been uh, adequately taken care of, but things would have been much worse for instance, if we'd followed the model that was followed in the depression, uh, you know, when we had this number of people out of work, and for the first few years of the depression particularly, uh, business was adamant that nothing be done, and so, uh, you know, government not intervene, government didn't intervene, and it was simply disastrous. Uh, and it wasn't really until uh, the brilliant British economist John Maynard Keynes uh, effectively pushed the idea that in a depression, you when you can't rely on the private sector, because the private sector isn't going to invest because they have no prospect of making a profit, that government must step up at the plate. And it, was in, it wasn't until 1933, well into the depression, that uh, the U.S. under Franklin D. Roosevelt adopted the New Deal with its enormous expansion of government spending, and that was the beginning of ending the depression. Uh, so, so, you know, today we're in a situation, or going to be coming out of a situation, hopefully, where we're facing the same kind of question. Uh, and, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting is that the public, because of the pandemic experience, is much more, I'm not sure they ever totally bought the idea from business that the private sector always does things better, but clearly now there's a much stronger support for, for government. And that's one of the reasons that the business community, which hates big government and hates big government spending, has been a little bit careful about attacking all the government spending that's going on that has been massive. Um, I think Rick mentioned uh, the piece recently by Stephen Harper, and it's the, the beginning of what we're going to see more and more of, the piece in the Wall Street Journal. And it warned about how enormous our debt is becoming and how we have to, 
you know, as soon as possible, cut back that government spending. And he even used the word talk about uh, practice austerity again. And he said, otherwise, if we don't do that, we're going to end up hitting the debt wall. And we came close to hitting the debt wall back in the 90s before we did all this deficit cutting. Well, let me just quickly point out, you know, it's a very scary story that we almost hit the debt wall in the 90s, except that it's totally untrue. We never came anywhere near hitting the debt wall in the 90s. In fact, we were always, you know, a AAA rating by the Wall Street rating from Jeff to go way, way down the rating list uh, to hit countries that, you know, were against the debt. Well, we were never, ever anywhere near that. But the fact that we weren't near that didn't prevent the business community from constantly talking about the debt wall. And in fact, sort of pushing the public to accept the deep, deep spending cuts that were introduced by the Liberal government by in the Paul Martin budget of 1995. And since then, there's effectively been this notion, small government is the answer, and we have to keep deficits really low. Until now, when we are seeing quite an acceptance of deficits, but I think what we're going to see is, and I think Nora referred to this, is this incredible, incredible pushback from the business community. There's no way they're going to let us bring about the kind of changes we're pushing. And one of the big uh, elements that they're going to have, to uh, big weapons they're going to have, is the size of the deficit. The deficit is going to be huge, and they're going to use that to say, oh, we can't do this. We're going to hit the debt wall. And, and try and stir up the kinds of fears that they did in the 90s. Uh, you know, let's not be duped again, because uh, the, the simple truth is we were nowhere near the debt wall. And I think what we should be doing instead is drawing attention to another debt story, in fact, a true debt story, which is the story of what happened after, in the Second World War and afterwards. We came out of the Second World War with this enormous debt. Uh, Fighting the war is very expensive. So, in fact, we came out of the Second World War with a debt that was 130% of GDP, which compared to before the pandemic, for instance, we were at 35% of GDP, debt to GDP ratio. So the debt was just enormous after the Second World War. So you might think, oh, people panicked. No, they didn't panic at all. In fact, they were anxious to get on with their lives. And what they did was they not only didn't do anything about paying back the debt or worrying about the debt, they simply borrowed more in order, you know, went deeper into debt in order to expand government and uh, build new infrastructure. It was a period of tremendous growth. And the fascinating thing is, in, in fact, they never ended up having to pay back that debt. What that debt ended up happening was, it, you know, the debt got bigger, but the economy grew at an even faster pace. So by the 70s, we were at a situation where the debt was, had been, the economy had so outgrown it, so that instead of the debt to GDP ratio being 130%, the debt to GDP ratio was down to just 20%. The debt was 20% of the overall economy, and it was just a non-factor. And in fact, in those early years after the Second World War, it was a period of tremendous economic growth, much more equal growth than we have today, much higher taxes on the rich and on corporations, much greater wage growth. Basically, it was a period of the rise of the middle class until we hit about 1980 when we begin this uh, period of laissez-faire economics, uh, extreme capitalism that we've had. Now I can see I've sort of run out of time, so I'll just quickly summarize by saying that we have a situation that is similar to that in, in, uh, that we faced it during the Second World War and that we faced a battle now, as David was just referring, fighting climate change is every bit as threatening a menace as the Nazis were in the Second World War, and it's going to take an enormous amount of spending, uh, you know, and government, heavy government-led involvement. So, and fortunately, we have extremely low interest rates. 
at this point, so we're in a very good position to do that fight. But we're going to face the mother of all battles from the, the whole corporate sector that's going to be fighting so hard against us. So I would just say, uh, you know, as we gear up for this battle, uh, you know, that, well, one of the things I would really stress is that, yes, we have to have strong social movements, but those social movements have to press political parties to take action because we we need a vehicle for creating that change. So, yes, huge fight ahead, uh, but for the first time, I would say in 30 or 40 years, I think we have a real shot at it because the change the pandemic has brought in public attitudes is so great. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Linda. Uh, so, so great to have you with us uh, on our webinar today. Uh, thanks for that historical context as well. Uh, and that encouragement. I mean, you know, what we've been seeing too is that uh, as, as you're saying, you know, uh, all those corporations that have been saying government needs to get out of the way and, you know, the free market is the only way. Well, nonsense, of course, and we're trying to put together some, uh, some alternatives. I was on a call last week and um, a few people were talking about the way forward now. And uh, I'm pleased you identified the fight we're going to see. I think you called it the mother of all battles. Um, we tend, I think, historically not to see um, progressive social policies following an economic crisis. We tend to see um, austerity on, on steroids. And so I think we have to brace for that. But again, the change can start here. And we're trying to demonstrate that with the good ideas we're hearing today. Uh, at the local and community level and uh, look to stand in allyship and solidarity with uh, those who want to join and uh, replicate the work. So I see it's 1113. I'm thrilled. We still have over 60 participants hanging on. So my, my clock here says 1113. So let's come back at 1118. That's 15 minutes. We'll come back at 1118. I hope everyone is able to stay and we can ask some good questions and have some discussions with our, uh, our distinguished panelists of the webinar. So uh, thanks again to everybody. Way to hang in there, um, attendees, and we'll see you at 11.18 back. Cheers.
All right, we have about one minute and we'll be uh, reconvening. Okay, it's 1118. Janine, are we able to bring the uh, screen back from the screen share? There we go. Thank you. Look at that. We've still got close to 60 people hanging on. The, uh, the coffee must have been close at hand. Uh, so uh, welcome back, everybody. As, as mentioned, it's uh, just after a quarter after 11. And uh, by the looks of it, we uh, will have uh, plenty of time for a good uh, question and answer session and discussion with our panelists and uh, amongst you as participants in the chat, uh, for sure. And as advertised, uh, we likely won't go uh, the full two and a half hours to noon, but I'm certainly uh, in the hands of our panelists and uh, you as the, the participants, the, the attendees of our uh, session together. Um, I would just like, just before we go on, just to kind of ground us again back in um, the... Um, the project selfishly that we were undertaking uh, here in Kawartha Lakes that was kind of the, this being kind of our launch, our, our first tactic. And, um, you know, this is our, our organizing statement to share with the panelists and the, and the group. But again, in response to the moment that we're seeing, the unprecedented moment, uh, Linda McQuaig also mentioned, you know, like too, since the end of World War II, um, to seize on this moment for something positive, uh, to rise above the old economic normal and all the problems of free market capitalism, to build what we've been talking about for so long. But given a paucity of kind of concrete ideas, um, you know, we want to make sure we got a short list together and try something local that will, as uh, Dennis Pilon talked about too, uh, hopefully be replicated and take off. Uh, to have a short list of non-free market economic measures here as a um, as a showcase in our local area, beginning at the you know, grassroots at the community level. And so kind of with that as our backdrop, well, we're very blessed here in Kawartha Lakes. We have lots of um, activists. We were the location while it lasted of the basic income pilot project. Uh, Nora, maybe you especially will be pleased to know that we have a uh, locally owned um, uh, non-chain, non-corporate media outlet, the Lindsay Advocate, uh, which had uh, promoted this event, and the um, uh, producers uh, are on the are on this uh, this webinar actually. So we have some resources and some ways to come together. But uh, I really like to enjoy this time together we have now for conversation, question answers, and uh, and ideas. So I'll um, open that up to all the Q and A function at the bottom, of course. Uh, and we'll see which uh, which of our panelists, again, you could just chime in panelists, really, at who'd like to answer. Uh, Andrew here talks about um, what universal fear holds us back every time from progressive decisions of government. Uh, you know, it's on the Patty platform. Uh, you know, he cites jobs, you know, as being a, a big, uh, big factor here. You have to have and preserve and create jobs um, and, you know, not to have that fear uh, of not having a job. I think, um, you know, he cites uh, the guaranteed annual income, the basic income as a survival imperative uh, of having jobs. That's kind of, that's kind of gone now. And so um, he's just wondering if we could discuss a little bit more about uh, the basic income as one huge revolution that uh, has actually received a lot of discussion uh, across the board. Um, would someone on the panel like to like to wade in and we can also I'll monitor the chat to see if participants and uh, people in attendance want to uh, 
talk about that question as well. Linda McQuaig. All right. Um, Linda, is your camera on? We can't, I can't see you. Oh, I, I don't, how do I turn my camera on? Just to It's uh, at the bottom. Mike, Mike, you, Mike you have, you have uh, kicked everybody off video. It's coming. I have. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps that's why. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how I did that, but I will stop. Uh, I will try and mend, mend my ways. Um, okay, Linda, go ahead and I'll try and get uh, a picture brought back down. Okay, well, I don't care if you have a picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the question was, what, what was what universal fear holds us back from, from bringing about yeah, change? And then he mentioned the basic we're income. On the basic income. Yeah, you know, I am not, the best expert on the basic income, I will say. I, 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 but, but, you know, let me just say that I would make the point that the greater interest in a strong role for government uh, that we've seen because of the pandemic, I think prepares the public to see the importance of something like a basic income. I mean, essentially, the pandemic has kind of created uh, an example of not quite a full basic income, but something closer to a basic income. It, it shows the idea that everybody, you know, that if we don't take care of people at a basic level, you know, that 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 will be terrible for the economy. Among the fact that it's terrible for those individuals. Um, could I just also go on to address what I think was also in the question, which was what is the universal fear that holds us back from making big changes like the basic income uh, or let's say taxing the rich or any of these things. And, and I would just emphasize that, you know, I think what's held us back in the past is, is not so much public attitudes and, and it's public attitudes are even more progressive now than they were. But interestingly, public attitudes on a lot of these issues have been progressive for quite a while. For instance, if you go back, you can go back to the 80s and 90s and look at polling about taxing the rich. And what you find is people support it. People support it by huge numbers. Does that mean we get it in terms of politics, Do, you know, and policies? No, we don't. And, and that speaks to the fact that the governments have so effectively ignored public opinion on so many issues and managed to get away with it. Now, on some issues, then there's been a huge amount of change. I think Dennis was pointing to the change on uh, gay marriage, that type of thing. Uh, but on certain issues, certainly on economic issues that the ruling corporate elite really cares about, it's been very difficult to bring about change. It's been very difficult to expand social programs that make it more, that make, you know, make them more generous not because the public doesn't want it, but because the corporate elite has such effective control over government. So that's what we're up against. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Linda. Uh, Jolie uh, shadler Benz from Lindsay here talks about the biggest obstacle being arguing between uh, progressives and supporters of uh, basic income, uh, you know, disagreeing on the amount, you know, what social services remain, what it would replace, you know, and uh, you know that having having those kinds of debates um, is her suggestions. Fighting within the ranks has always set us back. She notes. Uh, Nora, did you want to make mention a comment on basic income? Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm actually quite opposed to basic income. I think that it's um it's seen as a bit of a silver bullet, and we don't have um we don't take the time to really think through what it would do to to public services, right? It would effectively privatize public services because of the sheer amount that it would cost. Um, and then it would put the onus on the individual to have the buying power to then purchase the public services back because we've underfunded them to pay for the universal basic income. Um, uh, we've got two episodes at sandyandnora.com that, that go through those kinds of arguments. But I get the appreciation and the desire to have a basic income because uh, clearly when you look at the CERB, the number of people that were left behind from the CERB uh, and the anger around it and how manipulative the, the, that program was in terms of trying to make the liberals have... Um, I guess, political clout for the work that they did on that. It's very clear that um, 
a basic income can be very easily used by a, by a power uh, to, um, to, to, to give people some and to give, people, uh, to give others nothing, right? With the CERB, anyone who's making less than $5,000 last year, they didn't get it. And then anyone who makes more than, than $2,000, of course, has it clawed back or they could be finding themselves in jail or whatever the liberals are trying to do right now. Um, so I think that, um, you know, big, bold ideas are really important. I would, I would push back against the idea that uh, one of our biggest obstacles is, is fighting within progressives and coming up with uh, maybe our, our, our consensus goal, because these kinds of conversations are actually really, really, really important. If we can't, um, if we can't refine our own debates within the left, we're not going to convince a single person who's not on the left, right? So I really do encourage people to, uh, to have these arguments and to have these debates to refine them uh, so that we can come back against the logic that is often used against us um, from the right. And on the question of courage, I mean, you know, it is true that people uh, have jobs and they've got a lot of uh, barriers in their life that, that stop them from taking action. But there's a lot of us that don't. And there's a lot of us that actually could be doing more and that could be putting ourselves on the line a lot more than we currently are. We have to all take individual stock about where we are located and, um, and see what kind of things that we can do uh, with, the, with the resources that we have. You know, like me personally, I don't have many financial resources. I don't have a full-time job. I'm a freelancer. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons why my life is precarious, but I'm still able to take a lot of risks and, and, and do things that people say that they think is courageous. And from my perspective, it's like, I'm just, I'm just doing what my politics says I should be doing. Right. You know, it means taking on arguments from friends uh, that need to be taken on. It means educating yourself. It means, you know, taking that risk going to community meetings where you don't know anybody and, and, and just being like, I'm going to get involved or calling out your politician or, or engaging in civil disobedience. I mean, the first time you occupy an office is like amazing. Cause you're like, this was so easy. They were, the office staff was so nice when we kicked them out and, and took over their desks. So there's a lot of, of ways that we could build courage on the left. Um, and I encourage you, uh, if you are interested in doing civil disobedience, that might be a bit more radical, uh, like, you know, walking a road or taking over or blocking traffic or something like that, get involved or find other people who've done it before to learn how to do it because it is fun. I mean, I watch people radicalize by trying to drop a banner off of very high spaces in downtown Toronto. The banner drops were a disaster because our banners were too small and the police were on us within 10 minutes. But it was still an excellent exercise for young activists, uh, in that case it was in the student movement, to experience. So be courageous. Don't let them tell you that you can't do it. Just do it. And if you're worried about your job being on the line, be very like, intelligent about the ways in which you do it and the ways in which you, you're active. Thanks, Nora. Sounds like smart activism, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I was just seeing in the chat in response to some of your comments uh, and contributions there, Nora, um, strong reaction around, yeah, making sure that it's a kind of basic income that doesn't compromise existing public services. And we could talk more about that, but that's the Pierre Polyev uh, approach or, or the Milton Friedman approach to basic income, right? Sure, let's give everyone money and then they can afford to buy private health care. And our friends, rich friends benefit. All right. Right. And I think that's very conscious in the movement for basic income. Uh, I'm kind of coming up from the other side now and think, you know, basic income, can we think bigger at this moment? You know, and uh, Dennis, you had your hand up, so I'll, uh, uh, you know, switch it over to you. Thanks, Nora. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, you know, Nora certainly underlines lots of great things that we need to be doing, you know, concretely and actions that we can take individually. I don't see the barriers to things like basic income being primarily, you know, structural in terms of the design of the program or overwhelming the, the ability to pay for other things. It's mostly political. And I don't think the barrier is us or the people or we. Um, it's the old fashioned opponents uh, that, that stand in our way and, um, you know, don't want people to have protections against the market. You know, the key way of making people feel insecure is making them, uh, forcing them into these kind of market relations where unless they can find some way to sell themselves, uh, they are going to be at risk. And we can see across Western countries all sorts of ways of doing what things like the, the, the minimum um, income is designed to do. 
uh, all across uh, you know, Western countries, we see different ways in which governments intervene to protect people against uh, risk. Uh, against the you know the being entirely exposed to the market, so it comes back to the politics, and some of the politics stuff is just really basic, right? That are you know we, we saw earlier Rick put up a percentage of the people who are against some of the ideas, right? It was about thirty eight percent. Gee, that's pretty much the, the the rock solid level of support for the conservatives. And what do we know about conservative supporters? They are whiter, they are maler, they are richer, and they come out to vote more reliably than other groups. So. You know, some of our challenges are, you know, yes, let's get in the street and let's let's control the agenda by letting people know that we have lots of different ideas and lots of things we want. But at the same time, we have to have a strategy that's aimed at the state. And and the state, because it controls so many of these things, um, you know, these elections matter. Who gets elected to office matters. Uh, not because they're just going to go and do it. Obviously, you still have to bring the pressure on once people get elected. But this is where our enemies are very focused, very strategic. Uh, you know, the way in which they blow up on Facebook with all their lies and disinformation as a way of mobilizing their supporters to the, to the polls is a really crucial part of the fight. Thanks very much for that, Dennis. Uh, Pierre? Uh, just an instant, I would like to read uh, just uh, Sheila Harris on the on the webinar here, who runs the um, leads the uh, basic network, uh, basic income network for Canada. And her comment is the gutting of public services fear is letting the austerity stormtroopers define the agenda and reduce our expectations. Basic income Canada network modeling three options all show they can be progressive and can be financed through tax fairness and reprofiling existing money. And uh, in terms of smart activism, Kathleen has um, uh, mentioned that Extin Extinction Rebellion has some lessons uh, available. If you Google Extinction Rebellion, uh, some materials there on nonviolent uh, direct action. Just a few points coming up uh, through, the, through the chat. And um, Pierre, over to you, please. Yeah, very briefly, as you said, you know, basic income, there's different models. So, of course, but but to, to go back to the question that Andrew asked, you know, what's holding us back? And um, uh, some talked about the structural and political uh, uh, barriers that are uh, there. But what fundamentally sometimes holds us back is simple fear of failure. And that's why uh, I know in my life, I've, I've sometimes been involved in, in politics federally, but also try to have that that rooted in the community because you have a sense that sometimes you can have those small victories that then give you the confidence to have more victories later. And I'm very, uh, 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 of course, very uh, sensitized to what uh, Dennis is saying. Uh, as someone who helped uh, um, establish uh, Action Gets No, which is a municipal party in Gatineau and before the party was actually created, uh, which, which goes back to a question that somebody asked like more than an hour ago, uh, is that um, uh, we, uh, we ran five, uh, we were five uh, candidates for municipal council and we ran together. So even though no political party was established, we still elaborated a common platform and ran together on that platform still as independent candidates. Uh, and, and I don't know if that's uh, something, if you would have a team uh, ready to just run, but maybe run as a team or around a platform that maybe around some of these ideas that we've discussed today, uh, that would be uh, also interesting because, you know, we all, we, we need the, 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 the people who are in economics, uh, we, uh, but we also, of course, uh, need the, uh, uh, to, uh, to be involved in politics because the best way to occupy an office is actually to run and win. And uh, that, that's the best way to occupy an office. Uh, so, yeah. Great, thanks, Pierre. And uh, I can't resist uh, maybe being a bit pro provocative here, and I'd like to hear the panel on this. Um, uh, Dennis, this is your wheelhouse as well. Isn't running for elected office in Ontario or Canada really a fool's errand under the current elect electoral system? Wow, that is provocative. Um, look, it, it's not an either or. I, I you know, the, the reason why the left was the most powerful force in the 20th century was because they were what we called movement parties, right? They were mass parties. They had an organized uh, mass level of support. And here's an important thing to remember, you know, I mean, I grew up in British Columbia. 
Columbia, and the you know, left came on stream in the 1930s. You could not find one column inch of positive press for the CCF throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s. But nevertheless, that party would win roughly 30, 35% of the popular vote in each election. That tells you something really important. It tells you that that party had the ability to mobilize a group of people outside of the mainstream discourse, outside of the dominant uh, understanding of what was okay, what was fair, what was acceptable. So part of the challenge that we have today is that for all sorts of reasons, you know, even the NDP is not really a mass party in the way that it once was. And that leaves it quite vulnerable in office. The challenge they have is that once they get elected, they are subject to the mobilization of bias by the right, by the corporate owned media, who are able to you know, constantly supply disinformation and scare tactics. And then along come our liberal party, who are this wonderful two-faced party. They can, they can, they can, they can you know, face both directions at once. They can appear to be friends with the left and the right. But we know very well, as we've seen just with Trudeau, that they promise all sorts of things but in, well, once they get into power, then we see what they really do. So it's always crucial in running for office never to think that once you elect someone, your work is done, right? We always have to then try to anchor those parties to the policies and objectives uh, that we want. And frankly, we have seen success through those, those methods. I mean, I, I think people who want to dismiss the electoral arena are... are are not taking seriously the successes we've had in this country with something like healthcare, and they have not in the United States. That's a fact of gaining office and being able to introduce policies. So it's not to be all and end all, but it is very important. Uh, thanks, thanks, Dennis. My question was really kind of tongue in cheek around the current brick wall that is first past the post system, uh, and also fall, the false majorities that it creates in terms of our democratic crisis. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, say NDP in the 90s, yes, it was a false majority, but it was okay because it was an NDP false majority, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so how do we kind of navigate those things? Marshall Gans has a great book. I'll, 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 you're up next north for sure. Um, Marshall Gans has a great book, you know, when uh, and sometime, uh, why David sometimes wins. You know, the Old Testament Torah story of David and Goliath, where for those of you who know it, you know, the underdog David slides this huge, uh, huge giant. And what struck me as Marshall Gans gives a lesson is the lesser known part of that story where the first thing David does, it's huge, is he takes his armor off, right? He's not going to fight Goliath on Goliath's own terms because he knows he can't win. And that's what strikes me when the other parties have had 150, 160 years of, you know, uh, uh, colonial uh, power, uh, and it's it's their game. Anyway, I'm going on and on. Nora, over to you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm probably a, in a minority on the panel, maybe, on my opinions on electoral politics. Um, I certainly, obviously, they're important, and I've been involved in many electoral campaigns, including a very recent one uh, where we are successful, and we've got one of the most progressive, radical, militant representatives in a provincial legislature, probably the most in all of, uh, all of Canada. Um, it's, it's, but we all, but the left has failed to appreciate what the moment currently has done to electoral politics. And so what I mean by that is things are, are, like I'm thinking of a friend of mine who was a city councillor in a city in, in Ontario, I won't say where, uh, she was an excellent city councillor, she was left wing, and she was slaughtered in the last election. And she was slaughtered by uh, this very shady, quiet mo uh, movement of conservative activists and conservative money that shut out across municipal councils in Ontario, progressives who are looking for re-election re or, or, or not. And the left has just not been able to figure out how we combat the hostility and, and terrible experiences of running for office if you're not a white man. Like, I'm not, it's, it's, I mean, we have to say that, right? It's the... If you're a woman, if you're a racialized person, if you're a racialized woman, if you're disabled, running for office is a, is a nightmare. It is a nightmare. And you get elected and you get death threats and you get cameras have to put up your house and the police have to all of a sudden be the person watching, making sure that you're okay. Because if you start to buck into the status quo, the reality right now is it is actually very, very dangerous. And so as a result, we're seeing a lot of people not getting into those politics because it's not worth it. It's not worth 
the, the, the harassment or the, or the threats on people's lives or whatever. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about, yeah, electoral politics are important, blah, 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 like they're kind of important. They're, as, as Dennis said, that the, the mass po uh, movements behind electoral politics are, are really, really, really critical. And, and breaking that linkage between that, the mass and the decisions that are made in power, I mean, that is the real problem. And so rather than talking about, yeah, we can run and we can maybe make change or we can run and fail, uh, what we actually need is to focus on how do you build that mass base to then launch a politician forward. You know, there's a lot of really good uh, examples of activists who did this kind of work. Uh, you know, I'm thinking in Ottawa, I'm thinking of some folks in Toronto, but even then, their ability to challenge their own party has been pretty limited on a lot of uh, very important issues uh, with Doug Ford. And so what, I, I, I struggle for us to talk about electoral politics as being important without also talking about ha like the, the reality of what happens once you are in that electoral space and the very obvious limits. If you're in a minority, how do you operate as, in not a minority government, if you're in the minority, how do you operate? How are you effective? Uh, or, or can you be effective under certain structures that might be related to a specific party or, or related to a specific way that a legislature runs? I mean, electoral campaigns take a lot of effort and a lot of energy from the left. And we also need to name that. So how do we balance those competing forces uh, that, are, that are all kind of happening at the same time, but often in small communities, it's like the exact same people. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks, Nora. And thank you for naming and acknowledging those experiences uh, within the umbrella of running for office, right? Um, and uh, I want to switch, if I can, the, the conversation a little bit away from politics now. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're doing this in Core at the Lakes, at the community level. You know, we're going to do it ourselves at this point and hope it catches on rather than kind of bang our heads against, you know, the, uh, the brick wall of electoral politics on this stuff, for now anyway. Um, Peter has a great question. Um, with so much focus on a just transition, efforts to dramatically reduce carbon emissions appears to have become a secondary concern. Given the climate change targets we have to get to by 2030, how can the two complement each other? What role does encouraging or incentivizing lower per capita consumption play in this? So yeah, a bit surprising we haven't had more of the kind of um, green first approach uh, here this morning. Uh, and in terms of the sustainability and how the two are connected, the new economy being also the, uh, the green and sustainable economy within the means of our planet. Would uh, someone like to talk about that? David Langell, you uh, are on as our climate change activist. Oh, you're muted, David. Oh, oh. No, David, we can't hear you. Just one yeah. second. There you are, you're, the, you're home. I didn't catch the question clearly. So if anyone else did catch it, please go ahead. Just more around, you know, we've talked so much about a transition um, uh, post pandemic and to the new normal and um, an efforts to dramatically reduce carbon emissions. They seem to be coming in second right now. Um, and it, you know, as Peter suggests, and if we have to get to our, our targets by 2030, how can these two things complement each other? the economic new normal and, um, you know, basically making sure that we're green and properly so. Well, I guess on one hand, there's a tremendous sense of, uh, I guess there's a sense of urgency, isn't there, amongst a small, per, uh, a, a growing, but a relatively small percentage of the population and people are distracted right now. I know our community, and here's something I worry about, to what extent is our community exceptional? And, and I'd like to hear from others on that regard, but um, I think it's really important that we do take a leadership role. Um, one of the, I just got, came down, let me just tell you a little story. I come downstairs this morning, first thing on my screen, on my phone, is an advertisement from a company called Rockwell. They wanna sell Rockwell insulation, and they say that, hey, there's money, you know, there, here's what they're reading. There's, I think the government, federal liberals and and here in the city of Toronto have realized that the um, best route for economic recovery is to get on board with what you might call the Green New Deal, like the Europeans have done. And the business of home retrofits may be just taking off. So, so I, I am hopeful that's the case. I'll leave it there. I see Nora nodding her head. 
now I'm pulling a landjol. I was on mute. Um, Pierre, do you want to chime in, please? Well, just very briefly, I think that the uh, the current crisis, uh, and Linda mentioned it earlier, uh, it just it it showed that once collectively and governments decide to do something, and uh, you know we can. Uh, and uh, I think we need to apply uh, the sense of urgency and crisis that we had in the, in, with the pandemic uh, to the uh, to the environmental crisis. Uh, uh, so, and uh, I'm I'm involved with the uh, uh, something that's called the Green Economy Network, uh, and one of the one of the focus uh, is a retrofit. So David, maybe we talk off on that. But I think uh, I think for this forum, uh, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned uh, 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 ecological agriculture as an example, but maybe we think also in those terms what what could be done. Uh, in in your area uh, that would uh, help foster this uh, this uh, this uh, green economy uh, because we, we must work at all levels it's, it's not either or we must work at the international level the national level the provincial level and the municipal level hence the complexity of it all but I think the best uh, the best thing for future success is 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 building on real initiatives and, and show their success and then share those successes. Thank you, Pierre. I see some nodding in agreement uh, from our panelists there. I'm just looking at the clock and we have, uh, have gone pretty close to noon or we're getting there. I'm gonna make it uh, last, oh, sorry. I'm gonna make it uh, last call for questions and answers in the Q&A function or in the chat. And while we're waiting for any of those to come in, remember everyone's welcome. Diversity of views, please. This is a judgment-free zone. Uh, if you're outraged by something you've heard, please mention that too, uh, respectfully. Course. So uh, while we're waiting for that, Linda, please, uh, I know you had your hand up. Oh, you're on mute, Linda. Oh, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to pick up on the climate change question. Uh, you know, that is just so important. And it's because <laughs> the biggest problem we face. The pandemic will be nothing, I think, as David pointed out, compared to the climate change disaster that awaits us if we don't deal with it. And I love David's ideas about what we can do individually, but that must be accompanied by what we must do collectively. This is not a problem we can deal with simply individually. We must get government involved and government must embrace the Green New Deal. It must do all the kinds of things that energy, uh, you know, switching over to clean energy, public transit, all those things, they are huge, huge expensive projects. We face, uh, you know, I think I pointed out earlier, the battle we face is against an enemy as great as the one we face in the Second World War. We must win this fight. We must put all our energy into it. And if I can just quickly also pick up on the question about electoral politics. Uh, having uh, myself run twice for the NDP, uh, I ran against Christian Freeland, I ran against Bill Morneau. I'm very sorry to report I lost both battles. Um, but I do think electoral politics is important. I don't think it's necessarily important that we do it as individuals. Uh, what I mean by the importance of electoral politics is that we must use our pressure as public movements uh, to put pressure on political parties to actually bring about change. Uh, you know, in the last election, for instance, uh, it was great to see the NDP put forward a wealth tax uh, that was, you know, bold, but they did almost nothing after declaring, they did almost nothing to promote it. We have to keep pushing because the public supports it, but if the NDP doesn't bring it to the public, you know, doesn't make it an issue, we won't get anywhere with it. Great. Thank you, Linda. And uh, there seems to be consensus on the panel of reactions. Uh, so I'm going to take that point as, uh, as moderator to, to wrap things up. Um, we have some good uh, resources being posted in the chat uh, from Fridays for Future to Lead Now and Just Recovery. So there's uh, and a great 
a youth organization called Future Majorities. And yes, uh, Carol makes a great point. We cannot leave the marginalized behind, right? It's got to be everybody, everybody involved. I think we're seeing too now, we public consciousness recognizing more and more finally that it's about diversity and inclusion, absolutely, but more to leading to anti-oppressive practices and where the power lies and identifying those things and addressing that. Um, what I'd like to do is just in closing, before I turn it over to, to Heather Nickel, um, just mention that moving forward here in Kawartha Lakes, I'm gonna take everything that's been said today, the concrete suggestions, fantastic, all of the kind of the how-tos as well uh, from our panelists and from the chat. And um, we'll have a, a great meeting next week, our leadership team. If you would like uh, more information, or a bulletin or to be kept in the loop. We won't bombard your email. We're a very small shop here in Kawartha Lakes. We're you know, really looking at things here on the ground, but feel free to leave your uh, email uh, in the chat if you're so inclined, and I will leave mine as well. And that is how either here this way or possibly in the media, you can kind of see how uh, things will be developing. And please watch this space. Uh, we're very encouraged and very thankful, um, one, for technology that, yes, can be impersonal, but can also bring us together in good, uh, good for us, such as this. Uh, thank you for everyone's time. It's our most precious resource. And all of you have spent it here to move things forward for all of us and selfishly for us here in Kawartha Lakes, where we take away all the, all the words of wisdom. So again, a very heartfelt thank you. Merci, Marseille, Miigwech. And um, Heather, I'm going to uh, leave it and turn it over to you uh, to uh, close us out from, from Trent University. Thanks again, everybody. Hey, Mike, thank you so much. And, and to all of our panelists, uh, this was a wonderful discussion. Um, it's just really, well, it, it's nice for the School of Society of Canada to be part of this discussion, to help sponsor it, but also to be present. Um, you know, we're searching, you know, in my role as director, I'm certainly searching for ways to make um, the academic study of Canada more, more relevant to the lives of our students and the community in which we live. And, and this has, um, you know, been a wonderful example of the kinds of the forums uh, that we could contribute to. And so I would like to wrap up, um, Mike, this really wrap up by extending an invitation. I would love that this is not the one and only forum. I mean, the degree of uh, issues will change, uh, you know, COVID will go away and then it'll come back again or so, you know, but um, these, these kinds of questions and issues are ongoing. I mean, I think you're, you shifted um, and, and, and focused in on, on, on sort of the comprehension sort of, sort of uh, justice and equality, the way that there are a number of linked issues, right? So it's not just basic income, it's not just climate change, it's not just anti-black racism, it's, it's not just social justice, it, they, these things don't stand alone. So I would love to invite you as well as thank you. I'd love to put more work on the table and Mike, I would love it if we could continue some of these discussions and anything that we can do to bring the group together and i would love if at some point um we uh in the fall virtually or in person when we reconvene that uh academic year uh that we um or we we can be academia in person that that we could gather again um uh, together and that we could talk to our students uh there's just so much you know all the the insights and and um suggestions and, 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 and could help talk to directly to our undergraduate and graduate students about um, how they can be involved. And uh, I, I, I think that would be, would be stunning. So again, Kathy Scholl, uh, Janine Crow, uh, Allison Scholl, who helped uh, put this out to marketing, Mike, of course, for organizing it. Um, and I probably left somebody out and I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, but and then to all the panelists, thank you so much. And to you, Heather, for having the vision to, uh, to sponsor this from the school. So thank you very much. It was much. an easy yes. <laughs> yes is easy. <laughs> it's coming up with the ideas. And it was a pleasure to meet all of you. All right. Take care, everyone. Uh, on we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again to the panelists.